I think my interest in Jan Hus began because I've always been interested in dissenters, people who followed their conscience, people who did not necessarily follow the broad road or the consensus of other people. And I encountered Hus as a young boy in Fox's Book of Martyrs, and then more specifically as a teenager in a biography of Martin Luther by Roland Bainton. And Luther was actually my first love. He was the one I was attracted to first, but everybody was working on Martin Luther. There are hundreds of books, hundreds of scholars. And so I became interested in Hus. And what attracted me to Hus was the courage of conviction. A man who really lived what he taught, a man who was not afraid to follow conscience, who was committed to truth, to his understanding of truth, and who was willing to pay the price that following truth often requires of any of us and all of us. And so the other thing that attracted me to Hus was the fact that in English there was so little scholarship that had been done because so many people do not read Czech and of course, Hus was a Czech. He wrote some of his books in Czech. And once I got started, I felt like this was a place I could make a contribution. And so this was self-perpetuating in the sense that after my early work, publishers approached me to write more, and so I've continued to do that. But I think getting back to your question, what really attracted me to him were the things that I've just mentioned, that here's a man who really stands out in the later Middle Ages who is prepared to pay the price, the cost of conviction, uh, his fidelity to truth, his adherence to principle, regardless of cost or consequences. This made him something of a hero to me, a man who was unafraid to follow his convictions and to follow truth. Jan Hus was burnt at the stake for a variety of reasons. I think principally he was convicted of heresy. Heresy in the medieval church meant that you had chosen something that was perceived to be contrary to scripture, that you publicly proclaimed, and when you were admonished by, say, church authorities, you stubbornly defended your point of view. By that definition, Hus was a heretic. But you could say there were a lot of people who were heretics in the Middle Ages who were not burned. Hus was burned. Why? I think the answer to that is partly political. There were political factors that came to bear on the Hus case. He attacked popes. He attacked the church hierarchy. He pointed out that they, in fact, were not fulfilling their obligations as Christian leaders, as church men. And when he attacked them in his sermons and in his writings, they became very unhappy. The other item that has to be mentioned here is that Hus was disobedient. Now, disobedience is something the church felt very strongly about. You must understand that in the early 15th century, this is the time of the papal schism. There are three popes. There are religious wars going on. There are uh, political machinations, if you will, kings and emperors, and it's a power struggle. There's a crisis of authority. And the Council of Constance, which convened, was committed to cleaning up the disorder in the church. They met with two main purposes, to solve the papal schism and to rein in the dissenters. What they wanted from men like Jan Hus was obedience, to help them streamline the conflicts. And Hus, unfortunately, from a church point of view, was more committed to his understanding of scripture he was committed to what he considered to be truth, and he felt like he could not be loyal to truth and loyal to church authority at the same time. 
So he chose truth over authority. This made him disobedient. And the church ultimately found that Jan Hus was a liability. He was simply creating another problem for them to solve. So after a five-year court trial, which culminates at Konstanz in Germany over the last six months or so of Hus's life, he was found guilty of heresy, of disobedience, and when he refused to recant, when he refused to even agree to a very watered-down indictment, the council had no alternative, no option but to find him guilty, and so the penalty under law in the Middle Ages for heresy was death by burning at the stake. One of the truly troublesome aspects of the Hus trial is that he went from Bohemia to southern Germany and he went with the promise of a safe conduct. Now the safe conduct was promised to him by Emperor-elect Sigismund, who was the king of Hungary, who had been elected Holy Roman Emperor. Hus did not actually get the safe conduct until after he arrived in Constance, but that's a technicality because he arrived in Germany and he lived freely for about three weeks before he was arrested, during which time he had this document saying that he would be protected coming to the council while he was in Germany, and it actually says, and to return. Now there's been a great deal of debate amongst scholars as to what that phrase, to return, means. Now frankly, I think it means what it says, that the emperor was saying, Jan Hus, if you come to Constance, I will give you my word of honor as the most powerful political leader in all of Europe that I will protect you coming, staying, and going. As we know, Hus was arrested. He was thrown into prison. The emperor was not there. When the emperor heard about this, he was outraged. He threatened to come to Constance. He threatened to break down the prison doors because his name had been dishonored. One of the great puzzles is why, after Sigismund came on Christmas Eve, he did not release Jan Hus from prison. The Czech nobles, Bohemian and Moravian barons, filed letters of protest about this abrogation of the safe conduct, and Sigismund was thereafter always viewed as a traitor. And one other anecdote I should mention. On the day he died, Jan Hus said to the council, I came here freely. I came of my own free will under protection of the emperor who is here present. And we are told that he turned and looked at Sigismund when he made that statement. And it is said that Sigismund blushed deeply and looked away. So what is true is this, Hus had protection. He had a document guaranteeing him the protection. The document proved to not be worth the paper it was written on. We can speculate about why Sigismund allowed this to happen. I suspect it was political. I suspect Sigismund was unwilling to go up against the council because Sigismund had vested political interests in the council solving the problem of the papal schism, whereby at the same time uh, guaranteeing his own stability as a political leader. It is reputed that when Hus was at the pyre, he said, today you will roast a lean goose, but a hundred years from now a swan will sing and you will not be able to burn him. A hundred years later, in fact 102 years later, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. Luther believed that he was the swan. Somewhere along the line, Luther had heard about this alleged prophecy. Most people know that the name Hus in Czech means goose. So Hus was punning on his name. 
The problem is the story's too good to be true. Hoos did not actually make that statement. Where it comes from is he did pun on his name. In one of his letters from prison, he says, well, the goose is not yet cooked. In another writing, he talked about, I'm just a weak goose. I'm flapping my wings, trying to get the attention of the church. But after me will come greater birds like falcons and eagles, and they will soar. A year after Hoos was burned, his friend Jerome of Prague was also tried by the same body, the Council of Constance, and was burned alive on the same spot. And Jerome said, you will judge me today, but I will call you to the judgment seat of Christ within 100 years. Now, if we take those several statements, they were put together to make that very neat saying, today you roast a goose, a hundred years there will be a swan. Luther believed it. It was widely reported. In fact, it, it appears in pictures, in iconography of the 16th century, and even at his funeral, the man preaching over Luther's funeral refers to this story. It's part of Protestant mythology. It's not factual, but it is in a sense true that the goose was burned, but then later there were other reformers, Luther and many more, who were not persecuted to the point of death, who were able to reform the church in profound ways during the course of the 16th century. Jan Hus has been dead for 600 years. That's a long time. He has had a legacy. The first thing I would say is that his death did not cause his followers to become obedient to the church. In fact, they were outraged that Hus was condemned and executed. So what immediately followed worked itself into being a revolution. And when I say revolution, I mean not just a movement of reform in the church, but a social and political revolution. This would prompt the empire and the church to preach and to carry out five crusades against the Hussites. These are religious wars. Now the Hussites would win all of these. They would go on to establish a national church, a church that was in a sense independent of Rome. This is part of Husa's legacy. This would lead to political statements of religious freedom, one of the earliest ones in the history of the church. Another thing that is part of his legacy is that the church was willing to sit down with some of his followers and discuss theology and to accept these men from Prague and other places in Bohemia as equals. They did not come to sit down as condemned heretics, but as equals, almost like a diplomatic summit. We're gonna sit down and talk about how we can solve our differences. The second thing I would mention by way of legacy would be his contribution to what we now know as the Reformations of the 16th century. Martin Luther did read some of Hus. Luther endorsed Hus. Luther said Hus was a great man. Then Luther, other Protestants, John Fox in England, made him a hero. And if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, one of the main players is Jan Hus. If you read Fox's commentary on the Book of Revelation, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, Fox identifies as Jan Hus and Jerome of Prague, who was also martyred. So these two men become heroes of the faith, they become biblical figures or figures of biblical proportions in Protestant history. We could take the legacy out even further. There were movements that started in the 15th century that now exist at least spiritually among groups like the Unity of Brethren and the Moravian Church right here in the United States. These would be parts of the religious legacy of Jan Hus's teaching influence, and also his moral example of standing for the truth and being committed unto death.
Jan Hus has been dead now 600 years, and people might wonder, what's the point of talking about someone who's been dead for 600 years, who lived in a place long ago and far away, who spoke a language that most people don't speak today, and who came out of a culture that is pretty foreign to us. Why remember this man? Why talk about him? I think for Christians, he must be recognized as a witness of Jesus Christ, a man who laid down his life for what he believed was the truth of the gospel. Hus is important for us today, I think, because he is a prophetic figure. Not prophetic in the sense of predicting the future, but prophetic in the sense of speaking into and speaking out of a context. I think if Hus were here today, if he could see the disarray that is Protestantism after 500 years, if he could see the disunity in, say, American Christianity, I think he would have something to say to us from a moral point of view, reminding us that we should get back to basics, to the unity of the Christian faith, to the centrality of Christ, to the truth of the proclamation of the gospel, that we really should be endeavoring to be united in the essentials instead of fighting over the particular or the non-essentials that so often Christians become embroiled in. He is someone whose witness by example is something we need to come to terms with. We should read Hus, we should understand who he was, and we can find in him an example for ethical behavior, for the ethics of Jesus, and for true discipleship that he wrote, not with ink on paper, but with his own blood.